welcome to Transport Vlog. My name is Paul and I'm currently in Belmore Park, which is just outside Sydney Central Station. But this video is not about trains, it's about the L1 tram, there's one just behind me here, which terminates at Central Station. And at the moment it's quite interesting because the Alstom Citizus trams are currently standing in for the CAF Urbus vehicles. And that is what this video is all about. The L1 Inner West Light Rail Line starts at Central Station and terminates at Dulwich Hill. The line is just under 13 kilometres long and has 23 stops. Between the 12th of February and the 31st of July 2022, all services were operated by the Alstom Citizus trams, which were borrowed from the L2 and L3 lines, and I'll explain why later in this video. On the 1st of August, the CAF Urbus trams started running again, with two trams operating Monday to Friday morning and afternoon peak services between Central and Lilyfield. And over the next few weeks, further CAF Urbus trams will return to service, and by November 2022, the full CAF fleet will be running again, and the Alstom trams on this line will be a thing of the past. So this video will help you remember those few months in 2022 when the Alstom Citizus trams were operating this line, whilst the CAF trams were undergoing major surgery. I'll start at the Grand Concourse stop at Central Station and work my way to Dulwich Hill, showing you Alstom Citizus trams from a variety of different locations. I'll talk a little bit about the line, including its history, and reveal a few interesting facts that you may not have come across before. So the L1 does this one-way loop around Belmore Park. So it comes around the east side alongside the rail corridor to the stop within the central station. And then it comes back round on the west side. This loop around Central Station was originally part of Sydney's former tram network and was used by the Circular Quay to Central Station tram, although in the opposite direction to now. Anyway, let's see this in action, starting from here on Hay Street. So now running alongside, but slightly below the rail lines. Now crossing Eddy Avenue on this bridge. The trams set down passengers here, and then move forward to pick up passengers further along the platform. Here's one departing from the central stop. Now coming down the west side of Belmore Park, notice the central station clock in the background. These trams have five articulated sections. They alternate in colour between red and white as you can see here. This tram is now joining Hay Street, and the track along Hay Street was built from scratch. 
It was part of the first section of this line which went as far as Wentworth Park and opened in August 1997. At the junction of Hay Street and George Street, the L1 and the L2 and L3 trams all cross over. And this is because the L1 goes east to west along Hay Street, which then crosses George Street. And because the L2 and L3 lines run north to south along George Street, this creates an interesting intersection. Let's take a look. So that was an L2 tram on George Street heading south, and this is the L1 tram at the Capitol Square stop, which is waiting for the signal to proceed over the George Street crossing. As I pan to the west of this crossing, you can see two lines coming from the L1 line on Hay Street to join the L2 and L3 line on George Street. All major maintenance work for trams on both the L1 and L2 and L3 lines is undertaken at the Lilyfield Maintenance Facility, which is on the L1 line. So this curved junction enables trams coming from the Lilyfield Maintenance Facility to access the L2 and L3 lines towards Town Hall and Circular Quay. On the L2 and L3 lines, the Alstom trams always run in pairs. So seeing single units was unusual before they started running on the L1. This tram is leaving Paddy's Market and heading west towards Piermont and Dulwich Hill. Shortly after the Paddy's Market stop, the L1 changes from on-street running to segregated running, where it operates more like a train line. So the street running section is marked in orange, and from here it's segregated, and this is marked in red, brown or purple, for reasons that will become apparent very soon. Just here is where it changes. There are 60 Alstom Citizus trams in total, and to run a basic 15 minute service on the L1 requires six trams. The majority of the L1 runs on old goods lines, and just here where the line goes round to the left, if you continue straight ahead, this becomes what is known as the goods line, which is a pedestrian and cycle track. So the old goods line, which was known as the Darling Harbour goods line, originally went straight ahead, and this is what the L1 now uses to get to Piermont. The original line opened in 1855, and its purpose was to connect with a new freight terminal at Darling Harbour. If you remember this as an old goods line, do let me know in the comments below. These are the 5th generation or X05 version of the Alstom Citizus trams. The model used in Sydney is the Citizus 305 tram.
This tram is approaching the exhibition centre stop on a service to Central. And now leaving. Just after the exhibition centre stop is a small maintenance facility. Lurking in there are some CAF Urbus trams. Just like the Alstom Citizus vehicles, these trams also have five articulated sections. So I'm on this footbridge which is close to the exhibition centre stop and it's also just over this little maintenance facility. So the reason that the Alstom Citizus trams are currently running on this line is because cracks were found in the wheel arches of the CAF Urbus trams and they are currently being repaired. Most of that work I believe is happening at the main Lilyfield maintenance facility but some of that work might also be happening here as well. Within these train sheds. There is a CAF Urbus tram in this shed. See if you can spot it. Now for some on-tram footage. This includes another view of the two CAF Urbus trams on the left. Notice the temporary speed restriction of 15 kilometers an hour. Being able to safely operate the Alstom trams on this line required a number of temporary speed restrictions such as this one. All these sheds on the left are part of the Piermont Maintenance Centre. Until 2019 all maintenance for L1 trams was done here. It's still used but most major maintenance now happens at the newer facility in Liddyfield, which you'll see later in this video. And now a stabled Alstom tram on the left and two more sheds where I believe some of the Cath Urbus trams were being repaired. This is the convention stop. That tram was heading towards Central. Notice another temporary speed restriction here. Now a Dulwich Hill tram leaving the convention stop. I've marked the tunnel sections in brown. The next tram is coming out of the tunnel at the south side of the Piermont Bay stop. This bridge that I'm on now used to be an access to the Sydney monorail which closed a few years ago. This is the only station that I believe is still left. Actually it's not. There is another old monorail station on the Darling Harbour side of Piermont Bridge. Anyway back to this one. The monorail track and platform was within this circular tube. And the line used to turn left and run over this busy road which is Darling Drive. And if you're thinking it turned right in the opposite direction, well it didn't because it ran in one direction only. From here you get some excellent views of Barangaroo, Darling Harbour, Piermont and the CBD in the background. And if you're missing the monorail, then check out this front of train view video appearing on the top right. Piermont Bay and the Star Stops are both underground. This is the Piermont Bay stop, looking into the tunnel towards the convention stop. And now from the other end. When this tram departs, look out for the white air conditioning units on the roof as well as the pantograph.
as the Alstom trams were not designed for this line, they don't fit the platforms quite as well as the CAF trams, so these rubber gap fillers have been progressively added to the platforms at many L1 stops to reduce the gap. Although I haven't tested this out, I understand that they are strong enough to take the weight of passengers, and yet soft enough to allow a tram to rub up against them without damaging the paintwork. However, they do require some skill from the tram driver to be effective. Hmm, could do better. That's a better effort, perhaps 8 out of 10. The gap fillers have mainly been added to curved platforms, but I did notice some on straight platforms too. Sydney trains are also trialling these gap fillers at Circular Quay and Town Hall stations. So look out for them next time you're boarding a train or the L1 tram. Between Piermont Bay and the Star is a very short above ground section. It's close to Pirama Road and Edward Street. This tram has just left the Piermont Bay stop and is heading towards the Star. As this tram leaves the Piermont Bay stop, you can see that space has been reserved for longer platforms in the future. This is a typical L1 tram signal, with two white lights indicating that the line ahead is clear. And here is the short open section again, before the tunnel into the star. These monitors on the right are used to check the sides of the tram before closing the doors and departing. Notice the 10 km an hour temporary speed restriction on the approach to the star stop. The Alstom trams have exactly the same automated announcements as the CAF trams, so I think some copying and pasting of the sound files might have happened. This tram is approaching the star stop from the west. Notice the distinctive illuminated white vertical strips around each side of the cab, along with the headlights below. And now the red horizontal light on the back of this tram. And another tram also approaching from the west side. The platforms at the star stop are long enough to accommodate two trams. This is good forward planning, as extending underground platforms later is hugely expensive and disruptive. After the star stop, the L1 comes out of the tunnel underneath Point Street. So I'm now on Point Street in Piermont, and you might be thinking, What's the point in trying to get a photo here? You see the iPhone camera is small enough to see through these holes. This is looking towards the John Street Square stop, where this tram has just appeared. This short and deep railway cutting was excavated through the ridge of the Piermont Peninsula in the early 1920s, before this line opened as part of the Darling Harbour branch of the Metropolitan Goods Railway in 1922. Notice the crossover here, which currently has a temporary speed restriction of 15 km an hour. The normal speed restriction for CAF trams is 20 km an hour. Speed restrictions were introduced on all the crossover junctions between Central and Lilyfield after two trams derailed on the same day in October 2013. Although it was believed that the derailments were caused by newly laid track damaging tram wheels, these crossover speed restrictions have remained in place. 
Besides lengthening journey times, they also limit the ability to increase service frequencies in the future. Now at the John Street Square stop, and this is the bridge that I was on a moment ago. And here is another view of the crossover junction, which I reckon is used to reverse trams that terminate at the star. This stop is a hangout for the local birds. This stop is in the deep cutting, and although some development has happened above, natural light continues to filter to the platforms. At the other end of the John Street Square stop, there is a short tunnel, and you can see the light at the end of this tunnel from the platform. This stop has a crazy number of stairs, so most passengers use the lifts. Perfectly aligned, 10 out of 10. This bridge is between the John Street Square and Fish Market stops. And this is where the light at the end of the tunnel was coming from. This tunnel was bored through this hilly part of Piermont and is brick lined. This next tram has just left the John Street Square stop. Now looking the other way, and the line continues in a shallower cutting before ascending to ground level. Here is a tram coming from Fish Market. The cutting continues into the fish market stop, and here is a tram heading for Dulwich Hill coming into this stop. Looking south from the fish market stop, and the line runs alongside and then under the busy A4 Western Distributor Road, so this area is very noisy. Now it's the Wentworth Park stop, looking north towards Fish Market. The line has come out of the cutting and there is another crossover junction. I mentioned earlier that Wentworth Park used to be the terminus when the line opened in 1997, and being the terminus it was initially built with just one platform, which is the platform on the left that this tram has just departed from. So back in 1997, trams would use this crossover to diverge to the right and access the single platform, which is now coming into view again on the right. This platform is now used for services towards Central. When the line was extended to Liddyfield in 2000, this new platform was built for westbound services. Notice the rubber gap fillers. What lies beyond Wentworth Park is very interesting, and this tram has just been there. So almost immediately after the Wentworth Park stop, there is a viaduct, indicated in purple, then a tunnel between Glebe and Jubilee Park, followed by another viaduct. This section is steeped in history and is my favourite part of the whole line. This is the Wentworth Park viaduct, and this tram is on a service to Central. This viaduct stretches for 274 metres, 
and this makes it the second longest brick viaduct on the New South Wales rail network. Want to know what the longest is? Well keep watching and I'll reveal this to you soon. This viaduct ends at the Yellow Railway Bridge that this tram is now going over. This bridge goes over Wattle Street and the Wentworth Park stop is just beyond it. I'm now on the other side of the Wentworth Park viaduct and this tram has just left Wentworth Park and is heading west towards Dulwich Hill. This viaduct contains 1.4 million bricks and has 21 arches and a number of homeless people live within these arches. This tram will disappear from view when it goes over the Wentworth Park Road Bridge which also marks the end of this viaduct. At the east end of the Glebe stop something is appearing from the bushes. This is the Glebe Tunnel with the Glebe stop behind me. Can you see the lights? No not the tunnel lights, the tram lights. This tunnel is 800 metres long and it is heritage listed. It dates back to 1922 which is when the original goods line opened. The tunnel has a 50 km an hour speed restriction for the Alstom Citizus trams. This is because they have a slightly different loading gauge to the CAF Urbus trams and this explains why this tram is taking its time. The speed limit is normally 80 km an hour. In the Glebe Tunnel you can see the normal 80 km an hour sign followed by the 50 km an hour temporary speed restriction sign. The previous limit was 35 km an hour which is why this tram is accelerating. Here is the end of the temporary speed restriction and now coming towards the end of the tunnel. And now approaching the Jubilee Park stop. As this tram leaves Jubilee Park, here is another tram that is about to enter the Glebe Tunnel. As this tram fades into the distance, it's time for something more lofty. At Jubilee Park where I am now, the L1 goes over this wonderful old viaduct which as you might have guessed is known as the Jubilee Park Viaduct. This is the eastern end of the viaduct which is closer to the Jubilee Park stop, which is where this tram is heading, with the one behind it on its way to the next stop which is Roselle Bay. The Jubilee Park Viaduct has 28 brick arches and contains more than 2 million bricks. It stretches for 446 metres making it the largest brick viaduct on the New South Wales rail system. So you've just seen the two longest brick viaducts in one video. This viaduct has just gone over Johnston's Creek and this tram is heading east towards the Jubilee Park stop. This is towards the western end of this viaduct which is closer to the Roselle Bay stop and that is where this tram is heading. Like the Glebe Tunnel and the Wentworth Park viaduct, the Jubilee Park viaduct also dates back to 1922. And both viaducts are heritage listed. This is the bridge over the Crescent Road. It's noisy but with great views of the Anzac Bridge, Barangaroo and Sydney CBD and of course a tram.
you can see the start of the Jubilee Park viaduct in the distance. This is the east end of the Roselle Bay stop. And now the west end. The original goods line could have taken a more direct route from Roselle Bay going via Glebe Island to John Street Square, but this would have involved using the Glebe Island Swing Bridge, which planners at the time wanted to avoid. So the route that we have now required the two viaducts, the Glebe Tunnel, the deep cuttings and the rather circuitous route around Piermont, which actually works really well for the L1 in terms of providing convenient transport to residents of these areas. So I'm now at the Liddyfield stop where the main maintenance facility is. Time to see if I can spot some more Calf Urbis trams. The maintenance facility is on the north side of the Liddyfield stop. As you can see, this maintenance facility is very new. It was completed in 2019 as part of the CBD and South East light rail scheme. That's the L2 and L3 lines. So this is the primary maintenance facility for both the Alstom and Calf trams. This was on a Sunday in March 2022. So lots of trams are stabled here. Behind this also tram on the right are two Calf Urbus trams. Here is the first one, which is looking quite sad. And the second one behind it. Access to this maintenance facility is from the west side of the Lilyfield stop via this crossover, which can also be used to reverse a tram that has terminated here. Lilyfield is the only stop that has an island platform and it was the terminus of the Inner West Light Rail from 2000 until the extension to Dulwich Hill opened in 2014. During this time, only this side of the platform was used. There used to be a crossover east of this stop to allow trams to reverse, but that was removed when the line was extended. Between 1996 and 2009, the sole purpose of the old goods line between Lilyfield and Dulwich Hill was to serve the Roselle Yard, which was here on the map. So when Roselle Yard ceased operations in 2009, this line was closed. The plan to convert the old goods line to light rail was announced in 2010, with the extension opening in March 2014. As part of the Dulwich Hill extension, part of Roselle Yard was used to create a stabling facility for four trams. And the new maintenance facility uses further parts of Roselle Yard, as does the West Collex M4 M5 link. The remaining part of the yard will be redeveloped as part of the Bay's Precinct project. Just after the Lilyfield stop is a 15 km an hour temporary speed restriction for this crossover junction. This leads to what used to be the stabling area that was added as part of the Dulwich Hill extension. This has now become part of the access tracks that lead into the new maintenance facility. Now back up to normal line speed, and as this line verges to the left, it enters this deep cutting with this bridge above, which I'm now on. It's the bridge for the Balmain Road, and this is looking east. Notice the turnout for the maintenance facility on the line to Lilyfield. Now looking west, and this tram has just come out of the tunnel that goes under the City West Link Road. And as you can see, it's not in a hurry. And this is because there is a temporary speed restriction on this crossover too, and also for the junction into the maintenance facility on the other side of this bridge. As this line is newer, these crossover junctions did not have the 25 km an hour speed limits when CAF trams were operating, so these temporary speed restrictions seem to have been introduced for the Alstom trams. Now back on board and continuing through this cutting. and slowing down for the temporary speed restriction for this crossover junction that you saw from the bridge. And now approaching this tunnel, which doesn't seem to have a name. This tunnel was built as part of the City West Link Road widening scheme in the 1990s. Prior to this, it was a continuation of this cutting. It was upgraded as part of the conversion to light rail, and this included better lighting and fire safety improvements. Notice how the overhead wires are attached to the tunnel roof.
Now approaching the Leichhardt North stop, and interestingly, this stop has staggered platforms. Leichhardt North, a light here for buses towards Roselle and Balmain from Norton Street. I'm assuming that the reason for the staggered platforms is limited space. With the Dan Murphy's liquor store on the left and the City West Link Road on the right, it would have been necessary to demolish something here to have the standard side platforms. Also at Leichhardt North, this westbound platform was built for longer trams, as it would be difficult and expensive to extend this platform later, so good forward planning. After Leichhardt North, the line heads more to the south, and serves a further seven stops before reaching Dulwich Hill. The next stop, which is Hawthorne, also has staggered platforms. A tram in the bush. That was between Hawthorne and Marion. Marion has the normal side platforms that are opposite each other, with extra length for longer trams in the future. Then back to staggered platforms at Taverners Hill. And both platforms at Taverners Hill were built to cater for longer trams in the future. Between Taverners Hill and Lewisham West, the line is very interesting, with multiple crossovers and a bridge that takes the L1 under a major rail corridor. Let's see this from a tram. Just after the Taverners Hill stop is the first of two crossovers, and it comes with a customary 15 km an hour temporary speed restriction. This bridge coming into view now carries the railway line that runs to Central, Strathfield, Parramatta and beyond. On top of it are six railway lines, so it's quite wide. As the tram goes under this bridge, the abutment on the right side is quite visible. This next bridge goes under Longport Street. Now slowing down for the second crossover junction, also with a 15 km an hour temporary speed restriction. This one is on the approach to the Lewisham West stop. The disused track appearing on the right used to serve an old flour mill, which closed in the mid 2000s. This tram is going to Sydney. Well, I guess Dulwich Hill is kind of in Sydney. Lewisham West is the last stop that has staggered platforms. So I'm now at the Waratah Mills stop, and this is a beautiful little stop. I think it's my favourite on the whole line. This is the entrance from Davis Street. It's like a little nature trail. I'll walk quickly just in case there's any snakes. And there's a bridge. I need to be on that. I found the bridge, it's also on Davis Street. It's more scenic from this side. Might be time for an ice cream. After Waratah Mills, there are just three stops left, 
the next one being Arlington. And now it's Dulwich Grove. On the approach to the terminating stop at Dulwich Hill, the line goes to single track. The turnout is just behind these bushes. And here is one that has just left Dulwich Hill. Now the on-tram view on the approach to Dulwich Hill. It will come as no surprise to see a temporary speed restriction on this turnout. The single track approach to Dulwich Hill limits capacity to a tram every 8 minutes. So now at Dulwich Hill, the final stop on this line. Notice how this platform already has enough space for longer trams in the future. That was from the southern end, and I'll finish off with these views from the northern end. So now wrapping up this video at Dulwich Hill, I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, do give the video a like, give it a thumbs up, do leave a comment or question below and I'll do my best to answer any questions. Subscribe if you haven't done so already and also consider supporting me on Patreon, there's a link in the description below. So I'd like to thank you for taking the time to watch this video and I look forward to seeing you in the next one. Bye for now.